Welcome. Today we're going to talk about David Hume and uh, Section 10 of the Inquiry on Miracles. This is for the critical thinking class in philosophy of religion. We're much more involved and in depth into everything, but for here we just want to uh, glean some important critical thinking principles from Hume's writings. My text, one of them's in Texas, one of them's in storage here in Norwood, and we're in Mason, Ohio right now. Um, and uh, the lecture is brought to you by the original Angry Mint, angrymints.com, hashtag Angry Mint. Um, okay, if you guys get out the PowerPoint, there's way too much on it to concern you, so you can kind of skip to the Hume thing. There's a lot of uh, different interpretations of what miracle is, definitions, that type of thing. But uh, what we want to talk about Hume is that two main parts to his article, we, he, we can kind of sum up as the even if argument and the but in fact argument. Okay. So at first he says, even if a miracle occurs, it is still irrational to believe it based on how we gather evidence and in light of our experience of the world. So, if we're talking about a leaf or a guitar pick miraculously floating up in the air, and that type of thing, he's going to say, even if, it, even if God really did cause a miracle to happen, a violation of the laws of nature, where this pick broke the laws of physics and started floating. Um, we still should not believe it because our whole experience is that get gravity works, and that picks stay on the table unless uh, the force is applied to let them off the table. Okay? Now, um, so that's one thing. Uh, I should put a disclaimer, because in, in Hume's writings um, throughout and in dialogues concerning natural religion, he does want to allow for um, uh, the Christian faith to, he says that the Holy Spirit could have, as a lot of Christians say in, in Paul's writings, that the inner witness of the Holy Spirit, that God could give us this knowledge through an experience of the Holy Spirit. So he kind of he kind of throws a bone to uh, Christians, and you know what? Yeah, maybe you can achieve this knowledge through that way, but we're not going to know miracles are true based on even eyewitness accounts. So you would still be uh, unlikely to believe in a miracle. You saw it. Excuse me. Uh, let me just move on. Well, Rowe Summer, William Rowe, wrote a great book, Philosophy of Religion. He's an atheist out of Purdue. He's emeritus. But he said this. Premise one. The evidence from experience in support of a law of nature is extremely strong. We see guitar picks fall. We understand gravity, that type of thing. Premise two. A miracle is a violation of a law of nature. Conclusion. Therefore, the, the evidence from experience against the occurrence of a miracle is extremely strong. So all things being equal, we should disbelieve the miracle when we hear of a testimonial account that uh, a miracle happened, that your buddy flew around the house by flapping his arms, or that your mom walked on water in the pool last night, whatever. Okay. Now, so let's go on to what I think are actually pretty good things to think about. Part two, Hume's but in fact arguments. So, now I think that each religion's miracle claims need to be analyzed separately. We can't lump all of them together because they're very different. Now I've argued elsewhere that we should explore Christianity first because it makes the most radical claims. It claims that God, the God who might exist and potentially created the universe, designed the universe, and gave us moral laws, the power to reason, and love, and beauty, 
that this God actually showed up on the earth, walked the earth, the form of Jesus, and died and rose from the dead. Now, by far, the best evidence for any miracle in the New Testament is the resurrection. Things like uh, Jesus feeding 5,000 and walking on water, you have very limited testimonial evidence. But the indirect and uh, testimonial evidence from the resurrection is much better. So, all right, that's an aside. Now, what Hume says is that, but in fact, the situation is when we look at the, the evidence from all these different religions, especially Christianity, we don't have the best testimonial evidence. It's, but in fact, it's actually worse. And he gives four arguments. One, miracles lack reliable testimony. There are no credible witnesses. Okay. Secondly, humans tend to want to believe wild tales. And three, primitive peoples, not modern day people, usually produce these claims. Okay. And four, he says that miracles happen in other religions, and so they count against each other. Let's walk through these real quick. Hume says this, quote, There are no credible witnesses. For first, there is not to be found in all history any miracle attested by a sufficient number of men of such unquestioned good sense, education, and learning as to secure us against all delusion in themselves. Of such undoubted integrity as to place them beyond all suspicion of any design to deceive others. Of such credit and reputation in the eyes of mankind as to have a great deal to lose in the cause of their being detected in any falsehood. Now this is an important thing to consider. I mean, our law courts experiences. We want credible witnesses. And so, defense and prosecution, what do they try to do? They try to, to uh, challenge the credibility of witnesses on the stand. And I think this is also important. We see this when we analyze UFO reports. We tend to rank military personnel and professionals who are flying airplanes or police who are out on patrol or whatever, we tend to rank their eyewitness testimony higher than we do, uh, you know, Bubba and Stewie who are drinking a 60-pack of Schlitz on the uh, pond while they're ice fishing. You know what I mean? We're going to trust the uh, F-22 pilot over... Uh, Bubba and Stewie any day. All right. So this is important to think about. Well, are the disciples credible witnesses of Jesus? And so on. All right. So that's what Hume was kind of thinking. Jesus' disciples were uneducated fishermen. The credibility of those dopes may have been question. Secondly, Hume's second point, people really do want to believe the strange and unusual. So I give an example on the on the PowerPoint. When I was in high school, National Enquirer came out with Bat Boy. People want to believe in Bat Boy, that there's some half bat, half child living in the hills, terrorizing people. We want to believe the Chupacabra. We want to believe in Loch Ness monster, right? A lot of people are science Scientologists. They want to believe in aliens. That type. Of so it makes life more interesting if there's crazy stuff like this. Sasquatches. Sasquai. If they're running around the woods, life is much more interesting than getting up, having coffee, going to our cube farm, and sitting in the cubicle all day. You know what I mean? More interesting. So we should discredit people because people like to make stuff up. And that type of thing. But... We need to think, uh, well, that may not always be the case. We shouldn't automatically dismiss people, but it should make us wary. We should worry about what people tell us. All right. Third point, he says, it seems like all this, these tales of miracles come from primitive peoples. You know, the third world jungle or what have you. Okay, or first century Palestine, all this crazy stuff happening. So to quote him, he says, Thirdly, it forms a strong presumption against all supernatural and miraculous relations that they are observed chiefly to be to abound among ignorant and barbarous nations. Or if a civilized people has ever given admission to any of them, 
that people will be found to have received them from ignorant and barbarous ancestors who transmitted them with that inviolable sanction and authority which always attend received opinion. Okay? So, first century Palestinians, Jesus' disciples were, you know, uneducated fishermen. They made this stuff up, or they saw this stuff that they thought happened, and they just passed it on and passed it on and passed it on. Okay, and now it's Jesus, authority in the church. We should just believe it. Okay? So, if you watch the PowerPoint, I use the example of Han Solo. Okay? Or you could talk about Jack and Lost. There's the man of faith, and there's the man of science and reason. Han Solo is the, you know, the skeptical practical guy. Jack is in the TV show Lost is the, the scientist. You know, that type of thing. He's not going to believe this stuff even though he sees it all the time. Alright. Or Mulder and Scully. You saw that in the X-Files. This, this tension. Okay. So, yeah, Hume says, in the case of Christianity, there's a structure of belief that's passed down these primitive beliefs and miracles believed by primitive people. So there's some kind of explanation of why people continue to believe in this, in these miracles. Okay. All right. Um, fourth, testimony of competing religions destroys itself. What I want to say about that is that actually this is false. If, if there's good evidence for these miracles, at least it shows some form of supernaturalism is true, and naturalism or scientific atheism is false. So, and we have to examine these claims one by one. All right, they actually might fit in with one another, or they might not. So, all right. So, I want you guys to think about that. I think Hume raises some very important points just about critical thinking and reasoning about testimony. You know, do we have a credible witness? Is something on the line for this guy? You know, or is he just trying to get on TV or what have you? People actually want to believe in the bizarre and are often irrational about it. People want to hold on to some of the crazy uh, conspiracy theories. It makes life more interesting. You know, 9-11 truthers or whatever whatever conspiracy theory you want to hatch. You saw the Mel Gibson movie. Three primitive peoples are responsible for miracle claims. And four miraculous claims cancel each other out. Uh, briefly, I want to say a lot of people critique Hume. Even though we can throw him with some bones, yeah, we don't want to believe any ad hoc ad hoc hypothesis and just rationalizing. You know, we should, you know, worry about these miracle claims. But we also want to uh, um, realize some of these things he says, you know, might inhibit things like science and reason itself. Hume does actually allow that human testimony could overwhelm experience if you have enough critical testimony, enough people. He does say that uh, like people who live at the equator should not believe from northern travelers that water turns to ice because it's all against their experience. But maybe if there's a critical mass of people who've gone to the north and they all say water turns to ice, maybe a member of your tribe or city went up there and saw it turn to ice, then maybe you should believe it. But you should not believe it when the first guy comes from the north and tells you water turns solid. You should think he's crazy because that goes against your whole experience. Okay. Now, C.D. Broad is an atheist, but he actually says, critiques humans, he says indirect evidence might be more powerful than testimonial evidence. So, well, I'll quote this. He says, C.D. Broad says, an example is provided by the story of the resurrection in the Christian religion. The direct testimony for this event appears to be, appears to me to be very feeble, but the indirect evidence is much stronger. Quote, we have testimony to the effect that the disciples were exceedingly depressed at the time of the crucifixion that they had extremely little faith in the future, and that, after a certain time, this depression disappeared, and they believed that they had evidence that their master had risen from the dead. Now, none of these alleged facts is at least odd or improbable, and we have, therefore, little ground for not accepting them in the testimony offered us. But having done this, we are faced with the problem of accounting for the facts which we have accepted, which caused the disciples to believe, contrary to their previous conviction, and in spite of their feeling of depression, that Christ had risen from the dead. Clearly, one explanation is that he actually had arisen. And this explanation accounts for facts so well that we may at least say that the indirect evidence for the miracle is far and away stronger than the direct evidence. 
I give an example of uh, uh, indirect evidence. If you're camping, and let's say you have you're with your wife and two daughters, and your two daughters run out and they say, "Mom and Dad, Mom and Dad, we saw a bear. We saw a bear." You're like, ah, whatever, you guys aren't credible witnesses, you guys just want to make up a story, and whatever. But then you go back to the campsite, and then you see claw marks and shredded tents, and you see that they got into all the food and all this stuff. So you're like, oh, actually this indirect evidence is more powerful than the testimony of your daughters. Okay, so that's what C.D. Broad is arguing. He's like, we know about the psychology of disciples, they thought... The Messiah was going to be a king to overthrow the Romans, but this clown gets crucified, which in Jewish tradition, you're, you're the most condemned person. God's hand is not on you if you are crucified. And But guess what? Something happened three days later where they totally changed their lives and they went to the desk proclaiming that they saw a guy rise from the dead. Now, the 17th century apologists, people argued against Hume because they also said that, listen, you don't need to be a genius to tell someone is dead. You don't need a 200 IQ to know someone is alive. You don't need a high school education for that. You can be the dumbest fisherman in first century Palestine and see the guy has a, is dead laying there. And you can know, you know, Crucified, stabbed to the chest. And you can know that he's alive. That he's not suffering from his wounds anymore. He's walking around eating fish. Okay. So what they testified to is not some incredible thing. It's just dead guy alive. So I think this is huge. It's very different than other things people claim to see. And it's much more easier to defend than something like walking on water or feeding 5,000, or there might be alternate explanations. Maybe you didn't see the guy walking on water. That type of thing. You can know the guy's dead. All right. I'll be quiet. This is long enough. But uh, what I want you to discuss on the discussion board are some of these things. It uh, gives us some important things to think about, important things to critical thinking about testimony. And... I want you also to deal with the part one even if argument. That even if a miracle happened, it should, our experience should go against it. We should be skeptics completely. Now, in a ways, I think he is right. That's what I think. But I think what Hume gets wrong is the background evidence for uh, the miracle of the resurrection. And, yeah. How was it? Who was it? I forget the 20th century theologian. But he's like, everything changes because it was actually was Jesus who was risen from the dead. It wasn't Queen Elizabeth, as Hume's example. Everything hangs on if someone who claims to be the Son of God and to forgive sin and to give hope to the world and to give people a mission and purpose and objective meaning in life. It makes a difference if that guy who claimed to die for the sins of the world showed people how to live on this earth. If that guy was raised from the dead, it's different than any other Tom, Dick, or Harry who died away from the dead. All right. This presentation was brought to you by a tired instructor. Um, and yeah, try your angry mint, read your Hume, and email me questions because I did, uh, I give myself a B plus on this presentation. Uh, see you guys later. Today is the 22nd of November. 2013. Incidentally, 50 years ago today, C.S. Lewis, Aldous Huxley, and J.F.K. died. And if you want a great book, some good brain food, is Peter Kreeft, K-R-E-E-F-T, his book, Between Heaven and Hell. It's a fictitious dialogue between C.S. Lewis, Aldous Huxley, and President John F. Kennedy. If you do that, 
K R E E S T between heaven and hell. Um, yeah, I don't know what I'm saying. By the way, this person gave me their card and it's a guitar pick. This is the most this is the best business card I've ever seen in my entire life. Go Angry Mints, angrymints.com.